Jeff, I'm the founder and executive director of the National Security Institute here at the Anderson Scalia Law School. Uh, we're thrilled with you all being here today. Thanks for coming in at an early hour. We're very excited to share this event with you today. This has been in planning uh, for a number of months. Professor Jeremy Rabkin was the was the initiator of this idea that we should talk about the 200th anniversary of the Monroe Doctrine. He urged us to an event around the commemoration of this bicentennial with a discussion of what the Western Hemisphere might look like in the future, particularly as global repressors like China, Russia, and Iran seek to exploit America's retraction from global leadership. Here today to introduce the topic is Senator Jim Rich of Idaho, who you know as the ranking member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. His top priority in the committee continues to be strategic competition with China. As such, he's introduced and advanced several legislative packages, including the first comprehensive legislative strategy to compete with China. He's also made significant progress in strengthening NATO, defending human rights, and defending the freedom of religion worldwide. Personally, I know Senator Rich and his team, Victor Servino, Chris Socha, and the rest of the team from my time with Senator Corker, and I have the utmost admiration for him and his staff. Thank you for your dedicated public service, sir, and for working to make America safer. After the Senator's remarks, we'll move on to the panel portion of our morning. We have an awesome group of experts today, and there'll be a lively discussion. Our moderator, NSI Senior Fellow Lester Munson, former Staff Director of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, will introduce them following the remarks. We'll leave time at the end for questions from the audience. Once again, I want to extend a sincere thank you to Senator Rich for being here today. Appreciate it, and we'd love to hear thank your you. thoughts. Thank you, thank sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. This, uh, this looks like church with the front row in here. <laughs> we'll not be passing the basket, so you don't have to be uh, worried about that. Uh, today, uh, as, as we all know, it's the 200, uh, 200th anniversary plus, what, three and a half months or something like that since the, uh, uh, since the Monroe Doctrine. And certainly that's an important anniversary. But there's another anniversary in this room that's even more important to one of us. This is Victor's 21st anniversary as a United States citizen. So, uh, Um, well, I'm, I'm going to uh, talk a, a bit about uh, what, what's going on, I think. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm, I'm really good on describing the problem. Uh, the solutions aren't nearly as clear as a description of the problem. I leave that to all your good graces and, uh, and for the academics here. But uh, um, it, it is, it's really good to revisit the, uh, the Monroe Doctrine uh, um, and, and compare it to where we are today and, and, the, and the similarities to some of the situations that we have today and uh, hopefully to glean some, uh, uh, some understanding of it that uh, will, will help us deal with the situation uh, here in, in our, uh, in our uh, atmosphere. And it's, uh, uh, it's important to remember our history always um, and how it informs the policies that uh, we do today. And usually there's at least some uh, understanding we can get out of it that, uh, that, that helps inform us how to go forward. So as we all know, in 1823, President uh, Monroe asserted the right and interests of the United States to, to oppose foreign powers meddling in the Western Hemisphere, an idea that later became known as the Monroe Doctrine. At that time, there was a fear of new European colonies in Latin America, Russian claimed uh, uh, territories in modern-day Alaska and the Pacific Northwest, and they actually seized a naval vessel off of America's shores. Monroe's vision was that the Western Hemisphere was a totally different system of government and government relations than those systems that were in place in Europe. He thought we should not be caught up in the squabbles, disputes, and uh, uh, mercantilist uh, entanglements of foreign powers outside the hemisphere. Not a particularly unpopular or uh, foreign idea at that time. The world obviously has become quite a bit smaller than that uh, since then. Nonetheless, uh, the thought process uh, hasn't changed a whole lot. Well, 200 years have passed, and the hemisphere uh, looks different. We need to reassert the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, our need to reassert the Monroe Doctrine is more vital than ever. The sovereignty and national security of the United States and our neighbors is at stake. Today, China, Russia, and Iran aggressively exert influence in the Western Hemisphere and actually seek to control some countries. They conduct nefarious influence operations, bolster authoritarian regimes, aggressively I might add, including in Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, 
in Bolivia and pursue military and gray zone activities like money laundering and fleecing resources in the region. Uh, unlike some incompetent regimes, they never miss an opportunity and are very aggressive at seeing uh, cracks. Iran, unchecked by the Biden administration's policies of appeasement, has expanded its global operations. Last year, two U.S. sanctioned Iranian warships docked in Brazil. Well, Iran-backed Hezbollah and Hamas have expanded their networks across Latin America. Meanwhile, Venezuela has played a key role in helping Iran evade sanctions. The Iranian regime conti continues to acquire resources it needs to threaten the United States' interests, both in the Western Hemisphere and around the globe. Uh, it is past time the Biden administration change course and aggressively target uh, Iranian assets. It would not be that tough to do. We urge them to do that almost daily. Uh, we get resistance all the time, uh, but uh, they have a different view of Iran uh, than our side does. Russia has a record of deploying disinformation campaigns to destabilize our neighbors in the hemisphere. And Russia has had more spies in Mexico than in any other country. Russia has pushed the creation of its own Spanish language TV, uh, like Sputnik and RT. They have become commonplace in Latin America and have content sharing agreements with TV stations in Venezuela and an Iran-run Spanish language channel in the region. Uh, but Russia's efforts aren't just limited to disinformation. Russia has deployed troops, military aircraft, and naval vessels to Nicaragua and has provided Venezuela with over $15 billion for military equipment, including Russian-made missile systems. Beyond all of that, uh, the most substantial threat to U.S. interest in Latin America, as is the case most places in the world, is China. China has dis uh, displaced the United States as the top trading partner for almost every country in South America. Now let me say that again. China has displaced the United States as the top trading partner for almost every country in South America. Today, China uses Mexico as a hub to exploit our trade agreements and flood American markets with Chinese products like EVs subsidized by the United States government. Across Latin America, China uh, is extracting uh, lithium and other uh, critical minerals, which are key for its global military ambitions. <coughs> Meanwhile, hundreds of Chinese vessels illegally fish uh, our neighbors' waters, uh, stealing their resources and denying them economic revenue. These activities are a direct assault on uh, those economies and on the people. Worse yet, China buys land in South America, builds sensitive military sites, and then declares the land off limits to the government where it's located. Through this and other means, China is undermining the sovereignty of our neighbors and it is a powerful weapon against the United States. China is investing in deep water ports in places like Peru to link South America to Chinese ports. China has invested in 40, 40 port construction projects in Latin America uh, and the Caribbean. It has installed telecommunications telecommunications networks that expose our neighbors to data and cybersecurity risks and a network of military controlled cyberspace and facilities in Argentina, Bolivia, and elsewhere. China has set up illegal police stations in Chile, Ecuador, and across the region undermining uh, the rule of law in these countries. And Chinese military intelligence facilities in Cuba sit less than 100 miles from U.S. shores and in, proxim in proximity to U.S. military bases. This means China is increasing its intelligence collection on the United States and exerting more leverage over our partners. And it will get worse. As China continues to build its naval capacity, it will use these ports and other infrastructure to expand its military presence in our uh, hemisphere. And make no mistake about it, uh, China is very, very aggressive at expanding its naval capacity. We must prepare for scenarios where China uses these footholds uh, to threaten the U.S. homeland or distract us during a military conflict in Asia. Against this backdrop, I'm extremely concerned by the weakness of President Biden's open border policy. This policy has opened the door to our adversaries and allows them to weaponize the border against us. Since 2021, 294 illegal aliens on the terrorist watch list and thousands of special interest aliens from the Middle East 
have crossed the U.S. southern border. Nicaragua and Venezuela, two key allies of China, Russia, and Iran, actively facilitate this mass illegal immigration. Additionally, China remains the single greatest source of fentanyl and synthetic opiate uh, precursors to Mexican cartels. These opiates are, are coming across the border and killing in the hundreds of thousands of Americans every single year. And that is just what we know about. It, it, uh, we must re reassert our control over that border, particularly as it comes to drug interdiction and uh, unwanted persons interdiction. Finally, I would be remiss if I did, did not acknowledge the devastating situation in Haiti. The administration's current ill-defined proposals to engage in the mess in Haiti would lead the United States into an open-ended conflict with no clear goals, procedures to use force, or metrics to measure success. The administration must explain how an international security mission would promote a path to a credible political arrangement and elections in Haiti. You may have read, I've been one of the ones that's uh, uh, been resisting the spending of money in Haiti. The, the uh, administration wants to spend $50 million there, and I asked a question that uh, one would think wouldn't get much pushback, and that is, what the hell are you going to do with this money, and how is this going to solve the problem? Since there was no answer to that question, I've continued to, to block 40 of the 50. I signed off on the 10 because the other three corners uh, uh, signed off on it. Uh, but uh, I, I don't have, I do not have an answer for that. Don't get me wrong. Uh, the situation in Haiti is, is horrific. Uh, it, it is uh, a repeat of a situation that has happened several times in this century. And it has never been settled. And uh, when they get it settled down, uh, it goes to a, a point where it deteriorates back to where what we have today. There's got to be some very serious uh, changes there, and it's got to be more than just the United States that wants to do that. Indeed, usually if we're successful, as we were in places after the Second World War, the people have to want it more than we want it. The failure to carry out the Monroe Doctrine has, has enabled our adversaries to endanger the peace and safety of the United States. Last year I introduced a resolution to reaffirm the doctrine as an enduring principle of American foreign policy. In 1823, European imperial powers encroached on the Western Hemisphere and endangered the peace and security of the United States. Today, the threats from China, Russia, and Iran are no different. In the 21st century, the need to robustly reassert the Monroe Doctrine is as vital as ever before. In order to do so, we must secure our southern border, strengthen uh, mutually beneficial relations with our neighbors, and aggressively deter foreign powers encroachment in our neighborhood. Failure to do so will leave the United States and our allies in the hemisphere more vulnerable and less sovereign. With that, I thank you. I'm going to, uh, I have to get back over to the Capitol. Unfortunately, we have some things going on there this morning. But I leave to you your good graces and no doubt a robust discussion about how all these challenges will be addressed. Thanks so much. Thank you. God bless you. Uh, huge thanks to Senator Risch and his amazing team uh, for coming out this morning. That was a, that was a great uh, table setter for the conversation we're, we're hoping to have for the rest of the hour here. Um, I'm going to introduce the panel and then we'll and then we'll get into discussion. We'll do a few questions up here at the table and then we'll go to audience questions for the last few minutes. So folks, if you've got a uh, a very clever question or some way to embarrass one of the panelists, please please make a note of it and we will get to you. Um, my name is Lester Munson. I'm a senior fellow here at NSI. Uh, I am also on the Fault Lines podcast. Are we giving these away to everyone, no. Jones? We're not? <laughs> okay. Uh, whoever says the nicest thing about Fault Lines can come up and get my uh, little uh, drink holder there. Um, uh, I'm going to introduce a panel from, from my right to left, your left to right. Anna Quintana is the former staff director of the Western Hemisphere Subcommittee at the powerful House Foreign Affairs Committee. She is now uh, the senior director of policy at the Vandenberg Coalition, which is a, a wonderful organization that talks about American leadership in the world, kind of making the case for 
for the new world and why uh, U.S. leadership is so critical and, and adapting policies to uh, the current real realities and, and leaving behind the Cold War and that kind of thing. Uh, we're honored to have Colin Dweck with us. Colin uh, has written multiple books. You should read that. You should buy them. You should read them. <laughs> they are terrific stuff. He is a professor here at George Mason University. He is a non-resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. He recently wrote a very thoughtful piece on the Monroe Doctrine, I think for Hudson? AI. For AEI, sorry. Uh, for AEI, that is, that is a terrific read. Uh, Google that and take a look at it. Um, uh, Liza Tobin is Senior Director for Economy at the Special Competitive Studies Project. She's a veteran of the National Security Council staff. She has worked in the executive branch. Uh, she focuses on the role of China and the and U.S. competition with China. So we're going to have a very vigorous discussion here, uh, not only about the region and the Monroe Doctrine, but about the specific roles of some of our, our adversaries in the world. Uh, Colin, I want to start with you, uh, kind of another table setting question. Can you provide some context for us here 200 years after the initial Monroe Doctrine? I note that 11 years ago, Secretary of State John Kerry said the Monroe, Monroe Doctrine is dead. Uh, that appears to perhaps not be the case. Can you, can you get us quickly up to speed on the strategic implications globally for the Monroe Doctrine and why it is needed again? Sure. Well, I thought the senator did, did a great job, actually, in his, in his uh, remarks. Um, so it's worth noting the Monroe Doctrine didn't actually justify U.S. intervention in the region. Um, that came later with Teddy Roosevelt, who I'm a big fan of separately, but that's, that's another question. Um, I think it's worth noting that great power competition is nothing new. And we've sort of gotten lazy and used to the idea that there wouldn't necessarily be great power competition in the Western Hemisphere. If you think back to the 1990s, it was sort of unthinkable. There have been previous eras where there was lively, very lively, great power competition. That's what motivated the Monroe Doctrine in the first place. The idea was to say, we don't want great power competition inside the Western Hemisphere, particularly not with authoritarian powers that might uh, threaten our interests. So that was, that was a key element from the start. And the motivation for a lot of presidents in American history, including both, both Roosevelt's, uh, John F. Kennedy during the Cuban Missile Crisis, right, right up to the present, has been to prevent any uh, power, and the, the identities changed over time. So, it, you know, the Axis powers, the Soviet Union. Um, oddly enough, at the moments when when the U.S. has sometimes been less in interventionist, it's because it's been comfortable with the fact that it's been the dominant power in the region, the 1920s, for example. But you get this wave effect where every once in a while there's a new uh, a new threat. And I think we were sort of caught napping in the 21st century, getting used to the idea that great power competition was passe, that the main issues in the Western Hemisphere were sort of non-traditional issues, that obviously the U.S. was the dominant power. And then I think a lot of people sort of woke up one day and realized that, just as the senator said, China is a serious threat. I mean, really a first order threat inside the Western Hemisphere. So I think it's, you know, the Monroe Doctrine is still relevant in the way that, um, in, the, in the sense that the, the world is round, <laughs> okay? That hasn't changed over the past 200 years. Great power competition hasn't actually gone away. And so if we ignore that threat in our own backyard, it's gonna be hard to kind of win the away game, right? Let me, let me push you a little bit, Colin, uh, before we go to the other panelists, on what John Kerry said 11 years ago. Mm -hmm. Why would an American administration say the Monroe Doctrine is dead? What is, what is the alternative explanation for, you, for the U.S. role in the region? Well, I think for a lot of Democrats, for a lot of academics, for a lot of progressives especially, the feeling is mainly one of guilt, looking back at the Cold War, that there's a kind of guilt complex of what the U.S. supposedly did wrong. I'm not saying the U.S. did everything right. But um, I don't think that's the right way to approach it. That, that sense of kind of guilt over U.S. Cold War policies has informed really every Democratic administration since Jimmy Carter. And then what you get is presidents who kind of split the difference between that kind of nagging sense of guilt and then some sort of sensible approach. So whether it's Carter, Clinton, Obama, and Biden, for that matter, I think that's a major influence kind of among the left. And so you have people who are given responsibility for this issue who really don't believe 
when they look back on the Cold War, they don't think the problem was the Soviet Union. They think the problem was the United States. And that's relevant today because they're, they're interested in apologizing for the history of America's role rather than in kind of robustly protecting U.S. interests. So, for example, Obama was very interested to accommodate Cuba and, and reduce economic sanctions on Cuba. You might have seen him go to a baseball game in Havana where he was cheerfully sitting next to, I think, Raul Castro. Uh, so that was a great moment. He was smiling and laughing, and now we have to hear about how Republicans love dictators. Um, so, you know, that's an example of the mentality, which I think you get on the left, which is really this is something to be ashamed of, and what we need to do, if anything, is accommodate kind of left-wing autocrats. And you see it with Biden with Venezuela. So it changes. <laughs> now, it used to be Cuba, now it's Venezuela. The one thing we know, we know is it doesn't work. I mean, these regimes don't actually become friendly, nice, accommodating in return. They just pocket the money, crack down on opposition, and go on to their next aggression. Liza, let's, let's jump to China. Senator Rich threw out a bunch of amazing facts, uh, 40 port projects that China has invested in in the region, uh, China now being the biggest trading partner with many Latin American countries. A uh, lot, of, lot of economic links there. What is the what are the implications for the United States uh, for these for these robust economic ties and these Chinese investments? And then, you know, kind of maybe build in there. What's so bad about Latin America countries buying cheap Huawei phones? Should we really be concerned about that from a, a national uh, kind of defense concern? Yeah, thanks for having me. I think the senator did a terrific job providing a laydown of the comprehensive nature of how China's strategy is playing out in our region. But I want to kind of ask the audience, was anyone shocked by the facts he went through of China's putting military installations, SIGINT collection facilities in Cuba? I saw an update recently about the Chinese space station in Argentina that's, you know, they've been working on this for 10 years and oh shocker it's actually controlled by the PLA I mean um, you know malign fishing activities you know mass illegal environmental activities on a grand scale economic coercion I mean is is anyone here shocked in 2024 that this is what we're dealing with um, no I mean I see a lot of head shaking uh, when I worked on these issues under first the Trump administration and then the Biden administration in 2019 to 2021 and before that watching these things uh, when they were only known in the classified domain before that in the mid 20 teens it was it would have um, gotten either laughs or scorn or skepticism if we had said back in mid 2015 China has a long-term strategy to establish a network of global military installations around the world, including in Latin America. Here we are in 2024, and indeed they are. So I say that to kind of remind us of, you know, rewind the clock five or ten years. We were wholly unprepared for the comprehensive nature of China's strategy. Um, I agree with Colin on some of the reasons why this um, hyper-globalization had led us to be kind of fat, happy, and lazy about the free flow of ideas and goods and money and trade, and that will just lead to the pie getting bigger for everyone, and it's all great. Globalization is wonderful. Clearly, we're having a wake-up call now. Um, but the other thing that I want to highlight is we didn't take the Chinese seriously. Clearly, we haven't taken other authoritarian regimes' intentions clearly, but the Chinese have been signaling from early days that they have a comprehensive strategy to displace the United States as the global leader, not just in military, not just in economics, but across all the measures of national power that we care about. So cultural, diplomatic, political, information, trade, finance, all of it. Um, and so they describe this as a community of common destiny for all mankind. Latin America is just one of the, uh, the theaters where this is operationalizing, and so they do envision gradually you know, weakening U.S. global alliances, undermining the influence of democratic values in the world, and undermining the U.S. dollar hegemony and, and all the rest. Um, to get to the technology point, Huawei, um, again, let's, let's not make the same mistake again of discounting China's articulation of their long-term strategy that it's comprehensive and it involves things like the military civil fusion strategy which intentionally 
blurs the line between military and commercial. So let's not say, oh, there, all this economic activity over here being done by China is just economic activity. No, it's an explicit part of this blended military civil fusion strategy. So to think that Huawei is uh, simply a, a commercial company um, trying to sell its products and it's only motivated by profit would simply be naive at 2024. We've seen too much counter evidence um, on the ground and then from China's own words. So, um, you know, I think we're, we, we keep having the same wake-up call again in things like the space station, where now the Argentines are having trouble actually getting access to this facility themselves. So that's an actual kind of overstepping their, their sovereignty there. Um, yeah. Excellent. Anna, can you, can you bring us uh, kind of to the region specifically and, and maybe paint a picture of uh, the, the individual countries in the region where, they're, where they are looking for leadership? Uh, I think you know what I'm saying with that question. And, and where are the opportunities for the Biden administration and Congress, if they choose to take that opportunity, to make a difference in some of these policies? Sure. So I, I think to kind of put Latin America in, into context, this is a region in which the vast majority of countries, right, excluding the three that were outlined by the senator, are largely democratic countries. They have been dem democratic. They're very stable. They have great relationships with the United States. And they also want to be democratic, right? Like they very much aspire to reach this threshold of like international recognition. So when you kind of think of it in terms of like your question of where are there opportunities, I mean, the opportunities are plentiful. I think one country I'm going to say is probably going to shock a few people, but the current president of El Salvador, President Bukele, this is someone who aggressively wants to be aligned and align his agenda with the United States, but frankly has been receiving from Washington, D.C. and from largely from kind of, you know, the democratic perspective is that, well, we need to have an anti-corruption strategy when it comes to the region. And that being said, I, I think, you know, looking at what the kind of plethora of challenges that come from, like, the, from you know, kind of from great powers, our anti-corruption strategy should be aimed at countering China. It should be aimed at countering Russian like arms sales, right? It should be aimed at countering the IRGCs, for example, expanding role in like like Argentina's lithium sector. It shouldn't be aimed at countering leaders who say, "Well, we want to have closer ties with you, but no, you know, you just don't practice the kind of democracy that certain democratic constituencies want to that want to that you know that you know, individuals in the United States want to see. So I would put Argentina, at the top, rather El Salvador at the top of the list, Argentina, who their president has now said that he wants to be a part of a NATO global partner, which for a country like Argentina, given its history with the UK, that is huge, that is significant, and NATO should not fall asleep at the wheel on that. I, I think, you know, I would say, I would also put um, Mexico in the place of a country of serious concern, but also a country that, U.S. politicians cannot fall asleep at the wheel simply because our geographic proximity, we cannot divorce from Mexico, right? We share a 2,000 mile long border with them. Mexico is our largest trading partner. I mean, just the daily flow of trade across the border, I think it's like 1.7 billion just crossing the border. And, and that being said, I think we need to look at the USMCA renegotiation that's coming up now in 2026 as an opportunity to say, all right, China's expanding its footprint in Mexico, particularly in the Mexican auto Automotive sector and in Mexican lithium. What can we do to make sure that we push the Chinese out and kind of deepen our economic ties there? Colin, can you, um, I, I want, want to go back to you for kind of a, a meta question here. Uh, Senator Risch talked about the border, the U.S. southern border with Mexico as a, as a national security issue and, a, and perhaps directly related to a renewed Monroe Doctrine. Is this uh, and and we're all, we all see the news stories about things going on at the border and the political debate over that. And there may be, you know, it's in Congress, it's not in Congress, the administration is compromising, it's not compromising. Is this a new phenomenon? How important is this for a coherent Latin America strategy? Well, it's not, it's not entirely new. I mean, there have been, there have been waves of concern in the past over, over immigration, but the, I think what we're seeing now is something, the particularities of it are really new. I mean, the fact that with social media and with, uh, ironically, when, when people are kind of rising into middle class uh, prosperity, they're more able to, to travel. You've got, um, you know, hundreds of millions of people would love to move to the West if they could, right? And the, the asylum 
process in particular strikes me as completely bizarre and dysfunctional. I mean, I don't know. It, th there was just a story in the Wall Street Journal a couple of days ago saying that this is now just standard, that this is, the claim is made for asylum, and it's understood that this is what you say. So I think it's a legitimate public policy issue. It's obvious that the solid majority of Americans feel that Biden is failing, and whatever he's doing this year is too little too late. And I actually think it's valid to, to say, you know, our, our policy toward the hemisphere has to link successful outcomes that the, that the American public can support on <coughs> migration, great power competition, uh, counter narcotics, you know, human trafficking, d democracy concerns. All, all of these have to be considered together. And I don't, I don't know why there's such a almost a fanatical determination to avoid even calling it what it is, which is illegal immigration. Yeah. Liza, can, can you talk more about uh, uh, trade issues in particular with uh, the competition with China? Neither, neither party in the U.S. now is really willing to talk about multilateral trade deals or new ones anyway. There's, there's the possible changes to USMCA and, and the renewal of that, but there's no, there's no talk of a broader free trade zone of the Americas anymore. What, what can the U.S. do to better compete with China economically in Latin America? Well, I think we need a reset on our economic relationship with China. You have the Secretary of the Treasury traveling to China and coming back and saying that the key deliverable is an agreement to talk with Beijing about the overcapacity issue. Um, guess what? We have been talking to China about the overcapacity issue since 2006. I mean, the strategic and economic dialogue was this framework that was adjusted over time, and we would spend, you know, thousands of hours with the Commerce Department, the Treasury Department, the State Department planning for these meetings that we would hold every year with Beijing, same with uh, JCCT, another trade-focused meeting that was held annually. Um, the results of that were that China did not restrain its overcapacity. It's, it's doubled and tripled down on those. And so, um, you know, even in the last five years, as we've arguably had our eye on the ball a little bit more, they've probably increased the spending on their industrial strategies, their efforts to build up the manufacturing base and flood global markets and technologies by orders of magnitude. Um, so the problem is getting worse. And uh, one thing that a trap that the United States on both sides of the aisle has fallen into from the executive branch is mistaking the idea that getting an agreement to talk to China, to have a series of meetings is somehow a win. The Chinese are not constrained by these things. They use these agreements uh, to meet with the U.S. to get us to delay actions, delay tariffs, delay sanctions, delay export controls. Um, so that's a trap that I am afraid we're falling into. Uh, we have to, again, face the reality that this is China's strategy to use overcapacity to flood global markets and dominate uh, global market share. They gave us a gift in 2015 with the Made in China 2025 strategy, which was very clear in setting explicit targets that we want 70% of global market share in, you know, in such and such a sector, they ran down the list, it gave us the numbers, it was, it was very explicit. So again, take them seriously, reset the relationship and say, since we faced a strategic rival that has a supersized economy, second only to our own, um, and this is their pattern of behavior, no sign that they intend to change, we've begged them to change for the last uh, 18 years, and they haven't, so let's, let's now shift to a new reality of saying, uh, unfortunately, we may have to use tools like tariffs, uh, import and export controls, and then pursue uh, probably bilateral and plurilateral trade agreements. I agree with you on looking at USMCA and trying to fill the gaps that allow Mexico to kind of be a conduit for intermediate goods from China. But eventually the goal is more trade and investment with allies and partners and less with China. There's a lot of politics that get in the way of doing this quickly, but that does need to be the goal. Um, it's not going to work to continue saying, let's talk to China, let's, let's kind of hive off the positive parts of the economic relationship, let's have a win-win relationship uh, that the administration seems to believe there's still some chance of having some kind of a win-win economic relationship with China. Anna, do you want to respond? 
Sure, if I could just add a few points, because frankly, I'm a one-trick pony. I only know Latin America. I don't know China as deeply as, as Liza does. Um, I, I think, you know, kind of members used to ask me, like, well, how can we counter China in the region in a way that's, like, not a trade agreement, right? So there's a few low-hanging fruits. I would say, look at the countries that still have diplomatic ties with Taiwan. These are the countries that China is aggressively trying to poach, like Paraguay, for example. The Paraguayans right now want to be able to export Paraguayan beef to the United States. That is something we really very, very much need to look at because if Paraguay goes that's the last country in South America we only have I think two now remaining in Central America Guatemala and Belize so got to do something there as well Haiti is still a diplomatic ally of Taiwan so I think you know back to the point that Senator Risch made about the Biden administration's approach to Haiti I think the other one of the other serious vulnerabilities with with the proposal because I, I very much share his concerns as well is how China could potentially exploit this at the UN Security Council I would also add in terms of the other kind of things that we could do economically that are just easy and that are more politically palatable than a trade agreement is looking at various tariff reduction measures, right? The Ecuadorians for years, right, for I would say the last two years have been asking us, can we, you know, can you potentially give us some, the ability to export some tuna, some broccoli, some whatever, anything that's not going to compete with American industries, but that's not a free trade agreement. And I think, you know, absent leadership from the White House, I think that's why you haven't seen it make its way through Congress. But I think, you know, should the situation change come January 2025, we should call kind of we should expect a U.S. president to say, look, China's aggressively trying to push countries in Latin America. China is very much kind of making its way up the value added chain, starting off with these, you know, debt trap deals and then, you know, co-opting entire space stations in like throughout Patagonia and Argentina. So what can we do that we can get across the finish line in six months and a year? And I think, and also the DIBA, excuse me, the Development Finance Corporation, right? The Build Act was specifically made so knowing that the United States can't go dollar for dollar with China in terms of investments or financing in the region, but we can invest in strategically important projects, right? Rather, under the Biden administration, what you've seen is it's turned into like this ESG social impact bank, that unless you're referring to a project with indigenous women in like the northern highlands of Guatemala, it's not going to get funding. And that's, China doesn't care about that. China's taking over ports, right? China's taking over key infrastructure. So why aren't we using that money for, for those sorts of projects? Well, you do want the people on the mountains to be on your side because they got the upper. Exactly. They got the and high that, ground as well. Yes. Just, <laughs> That's what uh, USAID. Colin, uh, at the end of your article for AEI on the <laughs> Doctrine, you talked about rethinking U.S. foreign assistance in the region in a more strategic way. You talked about using the DFC, I think, along the lines of what Anna is saying. Can you, can you talk more about, about using those parts of the foreign policy toolbox? You know, we, the U.S. spends 30, 35 billion dollars a year on foreign assistance. Uh, is it being used in Latin America the right way? How, how do we rethink this? Sure. Can I ask Anna one quick, quick question? I'll allow it. Is the leader of Argentina as awesome as he seems? <laughs> I mean, he seems really cool, right? <laughs> That's what I think. Um, thank you. I just wanted to. <laughs> Well, actually, she just she just hit on it. I think a lot of the things. I mean, first of all, trade policy should be about trade, not ESG, right? So, I mean, I'm not sure this is politically possible these days in either party. But, I mean, targeting, you know, targeted efforts to reduce tariffs to key, to key Latin American partners would be a great idea. That's what a lot of countries really want. They want market access, right? Um, there could be ways to emphasize kind of private sector initiatives, but using U.S. U.S. government agencies and departments to kickstart it. Um, you know, these are these are tricky because there's not much appetite in Congress these days for this sort of thing. We're, not, we're obviously not going to match China, China's BRI dollar for dollar, and it's it's asymmetrical. But we do have certain strengths. I mean, just the dynamism of the American economy, the free market, can be something that we're encouraging rather than actively discouraging through you know. ESG uh, conditions on aid, for example. Can I uh, add a little to the question on economic tools? So foreign policy professionals love to talk about trade, and I think maybe because trade deals are led in Congress and USTR, and so this is just somehow in the lexicon, but FDI, I would argue, is more important. Um, the US is the global leader in outbound FBI, FDI. China leads in trade, including in Latin America. They out-trade us. That's just a fact. It's not something that we like, but that's the way the world is. But we way out-invest them. And I think in 2022 in Latin America, 
we put about 30 times more FDI into Latin America than did China. So China is not really a major global investor the way the United States is. One of my old mentors said that trade is dating, but investment is marriage. Because FDI represents a commitment to that com country or company's long-term economic health, job creation. If you put your money, your investment into a country, you want that to succeed, whereas trade can kind of ebb and flow um, depending on what China's commodities needs are. And the other thing about Belt and Road Initiative is this does not really represent investment. It represents loans, debts. BRI was a major outbound lending program. It peaked in 2016 and it's dropped precipitously in terms of the number of out outbound renminbi in that program. And so it's actually at a very low level. And some of the manifestations you see right now are kind of a function of commitments made years ago that are either coming to fruition or failing at this point. So now it's basically a propaganda vehicle that sort of China uh, mentions BRI because it's in their constitution. But um, I, I think we actually face a strategic opportunity right now um, in 2024, the U.S. economy is doing better than any advanced economy in the world. We came back really strong from COVID. Um, China, meanwhile, came back really weak from COVID. So I think we have a better opportunity than we've had in many years to poke holes in this narrative that China sells in um, third countries around the world that they have a better economic model to offer to other countries that want to develop without democracy. Um, and I also agree with Anna that we have to play to the fact that many of the countries, most of the countries in Latin America are democracies. Um, and I think we have sort of a value proposition that's a lot stronger now than we did a few years ago. All right, I want to, uh, before we go to audience questions, I, I want to ask one more question and, and have everyone on the panel offer, offer their thoughts on this issue. We've, we've talked a lot about trade. Uh, let's, let's shift a little bit to kind of U.S. military strategy and security strategy in the region. But, and thinking about the, the drug trade is perhaps the, the, one of the top U.S. concerns for the region. What do you see is happening now in, in the U.S. strategy in the region? What should change? Where are opportunities to make a difference in a positive way? Anna, let's go to you first. Sure. So I think in terms of our lack of counter-narcotic strategy and also lack of a willing willingness from two key partners, Mexico and Colombia, I don't think I've ever seen the landscape as bad in the last 20 some odd years. Mexico is like strategically trying to dismantle our counter security, counter narcotics cooperation. I mean, they've undermined the DEA. They like don't issue DEA visas. The DEA is limited in terms of where it can operate. They're claiming they're seizing fentanyl, but it just miraculously ends up lost. And now with the Colombian president and his plan to achieve total peace, which is essentially like this appeasement policy for their remaining terrorist and criminal groups. I mean, it's very, very deeply concerning. And I think the most clear manifestation of this, obviously, is the U.S. overdose rate, but I would also say the migration crisis as well, because it's Colombian groups that are trafficking people through the Darien Gap in through Panama. And these guys are incredibly, like, they're omnipotent, they're powerful, and, like, nobody is stopping them. Yeah, I mean, actually, Mexico, the current leader of Mexico is, is really unfriendly to the U.S. and his downgraded cooperation on almost everything. He's, he's uh, very friendly to our adversaries. And this is, you know, you're talking about right on our border. So there's serious security implications. You know, if you've got Huawei helping to monitor on the Mexican side, for example, the border. Mm. Um, so I think we have to treat that. I mean, hopefully there'll, there'll be a change in the upcoming election for the better, but um, I'm not suggesting any kind of large scale you know, Woodrow Wilson style <laughs> intervention, but I do, th I think we're, we're really gonna have to think seriously about what if under AMLO, Mexico is approaching the condition of, in parts, a failed state, and you have to protect basic U.S. interests, U.S. interests of U.S. citizens um, mm. inside Mexico and on the border, you might have to start thinking creatively. Liza. The fentanyl precursors coming into the United States from China used to come directly from China into the United States until a few years ago we came up with a, a wonderful agreement with China to collaborate on counter narcotics and clearly it's worked out really well for us. Um, yeah, I mean clearly Mexico has become a kind of a, a way station, a, a, a place for 
the Chinese to, to work around the controls and, and to cheat on the agreement that they made. Um, you know, this agreement was uh, revived and announced again as a deliverable at the Xi-Biden summit last November in California. Um, and the administration was, I would say, very cautiously optimistic. Um, I'm afraid it's only kind of a stopgap measure where uh, the Chinese on their end do a little bit of enforcement on the companies involved on the Chinese side uh, selling, you know, trafficking these narcotics. Um, but that will be cut off you know, whenever they have any reason to be irritated with the United States. So I'm afraid I'm equally not optimistic about cooperation on the China side. Okay, the floor is for Professor. My understanding of the 19th century version of this, certainly the original version of the Monroe Doctrine, was um, we, are, we, the United States, are really opposed to recolonization in the Western Hemisphere. And so that had two elements. One, the very clear red line. You cannot establish European colonies anymore in the Western Hemisphere. And second, it was unilateral. We didn't consult with any Latin republics. We just said, this is our policy. To Europe, if you try to colonize again in the Western Hemisphere, you're going to have trouble with the United States. So my question is, could we in the 21st century formulate a goal or a red line as clear as the original one? Because I don't think anyone really thinks China is trying to make a colony out of these countries. Right? So. Is there a line at all? And the second thing is, is it reasonable to think of it anymore as something that we could do unilaterally? N nobody, I mean, a number of people, a number of panelists mentioned trade agreements. No one mentioned the OAS. Would that be helpful at all to say we are fellow Western Hemisphere? And that was the original idea of the OAS, right? We, we have this solidarity as republics in the Western Hemisphere. Is there some way that we could? engage Latin countries to be with us in this? Or is it still feasible to do this unilaterally? Um, you want to go start? I, whoever. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that, um, look, the most likely thing you're going to get is, not from this administration, of course, but maybe a new administration, some combination of statements, presidential statements, declarations, speeches. Doctrine. Uh, doc right. I mean, call it, call it. I call it whatever you like, but um, making it clear that the Monroe Doctrine is not dead, as John Kerry suggested, but is alive, right? And that we have we have certain vital interests we're going to protect, and that would be a unilateral statement. So I think that's that's entirely possible. Actually, there have been big changes in U.S. policy toward Latin America between Obama, Trump, and Biden. Um, as far as allies, I actually think it's really worth thinking about the region in combination with U.S. alliances and partnerships in other regions, because it seems to me what a lot of Latin American democracies want is a good deal for themselves. It's not, it's not insane. They, they, they do a cost-benefit analysis. And if it makes more sense than to do business with China, they'll do it, right? They're not sitting here thinking about it in these terms, um, so necessarily. So we have to offer them a better deal. And maybe one way we can help do that is by working with other allies and partners in other parts of the world. It's not unreasonable for the, for the Mexican government to say, OK, you want us to ditch Huawei. What's the alternative? I mean, that's not, that's not a crazy cr criticism. So that's where we can work with, that's where I would say if we can work with allies and partners, we, even We can, we can in, now offer them Finland. Exactly. Mm -hmm. that, that's, ex that's a great example. That would, be, that would be a perfect example. Yeah, the question of red lines is really interesting. Should we have, you know, when I was there, uh, failing at countering China's malign influence in Latin America from the White House, you know, should we have issued a Trump doctrine or a Biden doctrine <coughs> saying um, if China establishes an honest to goodness military base in the Western Hemisphere, um, we will declare that that becomes a U.S. military target. If we are at war with China over Taiwan or something else, we will target China's military bases around the world in Cambodia and Burma and you know, Cuba or wherever else. Should we make that a declared policy? Of course, if you do that, you have to follow up. You have to make good on the threat. If you don't follow up on a threat, then it's worse than not saying it at all. So there's that kind of um, questions of theological questions about deterrence. 
Um, the other problem, of course, is that it's too late for a prevention strategy. So China is already here in the Western Hemisphere, so we're really in a position of choosing some mix of mitigation and pushback, and I think we um, need a lot more pushback, a lot more aggressive pushback against China's uh, malign influence around the world, not only mitigation. Um, but there, there is that dilemma that China creates with its hybrid gray zone warfare of establishing a space station that it insists is for scientific purposes only, and now, of course, um, inch, inch by inch in a salami slicing tactic, it becomes clear that it's a PLA facility, and by that point, it's already there. So, so we're now in a dilemma of do we say that that's a, a target? I think just very quickly, I would say that there should not be unilateral action towards, I mean, one, there shouldn't be, and nor are the conditions there in Latin America for something like that to exist. I mean, just the ties between the U.S. and, like, many of many countries in Latin America, regular diplomatic engagement, I mean, the demographics in terms of, like, you know, na former nationals who are now American American citizens. So I, I think rather we should look at it, like, in terms of, like, so your second point of, like, what are the, you know, potentially like productive forums. And I think the OAS does a good job at pushing back against authoritarianism, things like that, simply because of their current secretary general. But that will, he will not always be there, right? And his predecessor was Chavez and the Venezuelan and the Cuban regime's greatest enabler. So I, I think I'm wary of using the OAS as like the, as a forum, rather I would say just because of the like-mindedness that exists with many countries in Latin America and the United States just organically formed entities like <coughs> the Trump administration used to have what was called the Lima Group, right, where the Peruvian government was essentially the regional lead and convener against the Venezuelan regime. I mean, they literally had, they had other countries actually implementing sanctions against the Venezuelan. So I think it's, you know, it needs to be kind of more not OAS that the, the OAS unfortunately has a lot, they, they need serious reforms that have essentially been kind of co-opted in some respects by by China, so I, I think we need to look more kind of at our regional partners who want to work with us and actually be good players here. Other questions? Back up. That's a great discussion. This is uh, uh, So my question is specific to Argentina. Um, despite uh, Mille's promise to not negotiate with communists and to have ties with us that's in China, uh, but uh, during a recent interview with Bloomberg, it took more pragmatic tone. He said he uh, had no intention to touch the 18 billion currency swap and the trade relations did not change the beat. So my first question is, what action do you uh, recommend really to take to decouple with China at a deeper level in the near term, in the economic sphere? And secondly, in the military area, um, uh, what actions should uh, be taken to better align with the U.S. military and disentangle from the considering Argentina and the Federation to effectively more time. Should they easily shut down the Pan-Colombian space station and the deep water ports and other long-term actions? Okay, I'll just, I'll be very quick. One, I don't want to provide specific recommendations to a foreign head of state because I'm not his registered lobbyist. But what I would say in terms of as a former, as you know, I used to work for the U.S. government, what I think what I would be helpful in terms from a U.S. national security perspective is they need to look at the agreement that they have with the China, with the PLA at the Patagonia Space Center. And I would say from like the U.S. perspective, we also need to come to the table here and help them develop their space their, their space program, right? We do, we're doing that with the Brazilian government, right? When President Trump and President Bolsonaro, President Bolsonaro signed the Technological Safeguards Agreement, right? And that essentially has catapulted American investment and American presence in Brazil's commercial space sector, I think we ought to be doing that with the Argentines as well. And beyond the space sector, I would say lithium, right? Argentina, Bolivia, and Chile, they are, they are home to 70% of the world's proven lithium deposits. And we need to push the Chinese out to the extent that we can out of that sector, especially if we are trying to transition to different forms of greener technology. I agree, and I would just add one more sector to that is cloud computing. The U.S. has a massive advantage. I think we occupy about two-thirds of the global market in cloud computing with our leaders here. Um, China, Huawei, you know, 
uh, their own cloud computing companies are trying to steal a march on us and they see opportunity in Latin America and so their share of the cloud market in Latin America is growing faster than it is in many other regions of the world where the U.S. is still dominant. So I think we have to double down on our advantage there and make sure that we're not seeding this. Of course, cloud computing is massively important in the age of AI, and so we don't want China to be kind of occupying that, that space in Latin America. Okay. Other questions? Over here. So uh, just transitioning a little bit over to uh, a different uh, in the same vein of trying to continue the doctrine and the legacy of authoritarian regimes need to stop trying to interfere with the democratic uh, web of nations, the democratic order, what do you think the future will be for the Indo-Pacific region and more specifically the uh, Australian, UK, and US region? You know, the, uh, when I was thinking about this panel, the question of do we need to revive the Monroe Doctrine to counter what China is doing in our region, the flip side of that is does China have a Monroe Doctrine in its region? Well, yes, clearly. Obviously, they want to push the U.S. out eventually of the Indo-Pacific. really bothers them that our military has presence there and that we fly, you know, fly and sail operations through that region. So, yes, they have the equivalent of a Monroe Doctrine where they're, they're trying to eventually rid the region of the U.S. military uh, presence, um, but we can't let it distract us from the global nature of their strategy and the fact that they want to displace us globally. Um, AUKUS is really encouraging. Um, this is exactly the type of thing where Beijing sees the world's democracies kind of coalescing against it. This really gets under their skin and bothers them. And the fact that the administration is now talking about expanding pillar two of AUKUS, AUKUS this is the emerging technology focused pillar, to include other partners, Japan certainly, but they've emphasized that J Japan is not the only uh, country that they want to include in pillar two. So we wouldn't be surprised if we see, you know, maybe Korea or European states or others being included in this. So that's terrific. The more the merrier expanding this new alliance structure. Um, so I would give the Biden administration credit for all the good work they've done kind of expanding these um, new and emerging alliance frameworks. I, I agree with that, except for the last three seconds, <laughs> I would give the Biden team a little less credit. Um, Just a little bit. Because on the one hand, there's a tendency to speak loudly, and then the other hand, carry a small stick. I mean, clearly, we, we don't have the military spending. And there's plenty of blame to go around. That's a bipartisan problem, right? But um, we're, in terms of capabilities and commitments, it's seriously out of whack right now. We can't play the role that we're trying to play in the world with this massive Chinese buildup in the Indo-Pacific. And, and just keep kind of drifting with. So these things are interrelated. And just to loop back to, but I thought I thought you made a great point, Liza, on the, the connecting tissue between these regions. They have to be seen as interconnected. You can't compete with China in just one region, because it's going. You know, that's the point. Is that in in Latin America, uh, they will go out of their way to distract us, make our life difficult, pin us down in our own backyard, basically, in geopolitical terms. And that's going to have implications for Indo-Pacific, or Middle East, or Europe, and vice versa. So, you know, you end up kind of losing on multiple fronts, and I'm, I'm afraid that's what we're doing right now, actually. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. In the back. Just a quick comment. Um, would be a, is it a good comparison, or is there a lesson for Latin America? what China has done um, and talked about fusion of uh, military government and trade within, Af within Africa and negative impact of you know, corruption and um, taking over natural resources. Is that a lesson for, for Latin America to, and, and should we communicate that to um, our partners in Latin America? Uh, certainly, I mean, China sinks to the lowest common denominator of whatever the governance system of the country it's operating in. And so if you have a weakly governed nation that 
doesn't have the will or the ability to enforce environmental regulations, IUU fishing regulations, um, you know, access to sovereign territory like space stations, then China will exploit every loophole. But if the host nation is very strong in pushing back and, you know, insisting on transparency, um, China is somewhat constrained, somewhat. Um, so yes, absolutely. Um, I think we have many more natural advantages in Latin America than we do in Africa because of geography and democracy and shared culture and, and all of the rest. Um, uh, so the only, the only other thing I'll note in terms of sort of global resources, Colin makes a good point about insufficient military spending in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, it's the hardest thing in the world in policy to prioritize. So to get more spending into the Indo-Pacific, it's kind of clear to me that we need to move the money away from CENTCOM. That's where a lot of the money is being spent. And so it's just extremely difficult to pull funding, personnel, resources out of one region because then China finds a gap. So this, these really are difficult choices. If I could just quickly add one thing. I think better lessons learned for Latin America not, are not gonna come from Africa, but are gonna come from Latin American countries that have been burned by China, right? So one case in particular is Ecuador, right? Ecuador, the Chinese came in, and this was under the previous like radically like leftist autocratic president, negotiated this insanely corrupt, like super sketchy deal to build this like hydroelectric dam, right? And this dam was supposed to solve Ecuador's like energy troubles and was supposed to help Ecuador actually earn a lot more money from like oil exports, right? So fast forward 10 years, the Coca-Cola, the Sinclair Dam, look up the New York Times article on this dam and just kind of how much of a disaster it turned out. And I'm saying the word disaster because I don't want to be vulgar in public, but it is awful. And the deal that the Chinese negotiated was brilliant, right? So like not only were the Chinese also providing the financing at absurd terms, but should Ecuador not pay back the financing, the Ecuador then had to pay the Chinese back with just straight oil. Just like, give us all your oil. This is stuff you're going to use to kind of feed your people, but give it all to us. And then the dam didn't work. And so even if the dam didn't work, this did, Ecuador still had to pay the Chinese back. The dam is now crumbling. It's become this huge environmental disaster. It's become a very like political like flashpoint within the country. And in the meanwhile, China's also swarming Ecuador's coast with like all of these like fishing vessels. And the Ecuadorians couldn't really do anything about it because they're trying to negotiate this debt deal. And meanwhile, the United States, right, we used to have a position in Ecuador at the, um, God, what was it called, this this particular like military base, we were no longer there anymore kind of conducting counter narcotics flights and being able to actually see the other stuff that's going around. And the Galapagos, which is like this beautiful like nature, you know, kind of in terms of like conservation, it's like the ideal thing. Chinese were also taking advantage of that. I mean, it was the most like win-win-win scenario for the Chinese. So that is the best example for kind of the rest of the region looking at like, could China potentially solve my energy problem? Absolutely not. All right, we'll use the Galapagos to say U.S. policy in Latin America needs to evolve. Um, uh, many thanks to NSI and the staff here, Devlin, Jessica, Jamil, uh, everyone else here, and to our panelists, Anna, Colin, Liza. Thank you very much. What's that? And uh, Yes, sorry, everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so dumb on China. I